Welcome to GAF Dash Lockdown, a regular show where we educate ourselves for the struggle to come. Uh, today, we are going to be talking with Peter Kelderlus, an anarchist activist and writer who for, year, for years has been talking about the dangers of the non of the nonviolent doctrine, nonviolent doctrine in a social movement, and advocating for a diversity of tactics as necessary for achieving meaningful social ch change. Um, but before we get to that. I want to uh, remind everyone that the Green Anti-Capitalist Front is an alliance of groups and individuals united by a belief that capitalism is one of the core causes of the environmental crisis threatening us all. And if we don't act now, the cause of that crisis will fall on the poor and powerless. Uh, if you want to get involved, you can contact one of the existing groups, which you can find in places like London, Birmingham, Glasgow, and Edinburgh, among others. Uh, all the contact info is on our website, greenanticapitalist.org. But also remember that GAF is a front, and as such, as soon as you agree with or aims and principles, you can, you can create your own collective or take action under the GAF banner without having to ask for permission. And indeed, we encourage you to do so. And finally, uh, before we begin, I'd like to shout out the different struggles and campaigns happening around the world and locally that you can, su that you can support. Uh, first of all, uh, the Anarchist Black Cross uh, from Re Belarus is calling for a week of solidarity with anarchists and anti-fascists in Belarus, uh, starting from the 23rd, 23rd of November, so a few days ago, and going until the 13th, uh, the 30th of November. Um, so we encourage everyone to join and take action in support with uh, the, an the anti-authoritarian struggle that is happening in Belarus right now. And also in relation to this, they have an ongoing crowdfunding campaign to raise money for those fighting against the authoritarian regime of in Belarus. Um, there's a website, on the, the has, there's a campaign for it on, on Fire Fund. Uh, we'll, you can find the links to that. Um, we'll, share, we'll, share, we'll share them later. Um, also, we've been asked to, uh, to let people know that the territory of Sengal, uh, which was liberated by the Ruyaba, Ruyaba army, uh, some years ago, and since then adopted the same democratic structures, is currently under the threat of attack by the Iraqi state, uh, which could result on a genocide of its people and the destruction of the democratic uh, structures that have been set up. Uh, so there's a call to actions to uh, in solidarity, which is supposed to be this Thursday, so today, uh, 20th of November. Um, but even if you couldn't, you didn't know about it before and couldn't take action today, uh, there's, uh, we have been told that to be in permanent alert in case of other actions of aggression are being taken and because an inv invasion may, may happen anytime. So even if you couldn't take action today, uh, be on the watch out, uh, uh, prepare to organize uh, solidarity um, in case it's needed. Um, finally, we wanted to give a shout out to the Collective Action, Lo to Collective Action London, which is raising uh, money to support a community of refugees currently be ha being housed locally in South London. Uh, this campaign is being run due to the difficulties faced by re refugees in affording even the most basic necessities due to the restrict restrictions imposed by the Home Office and the ways in which individuals often feel dishumanized by the systems available to them to seek help. Uh, it will be really useful if you could donate uh, to them and also spread the word. All of these uh, things we're talking about, we will make a post later today or tomorrow in our website uh, with the links where you can find all the information. Um, to, to be, to, so we, we on the lookout for that. And also if you follow us on social media, we usually also share it. Um, so with that out of the way, um, I want to welcome our guest today, Peter Gedelus. Uh, hi, Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, all, all. How's everyone over there? Yeah, it's going good. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so, so, first of all, I think this is uh, what we're going to be talking about is generally uh, the topics of violence, no violence, diversity of tactics, and all these discussions that have been happening uh, for quite some time in social movements. Uh, so maybe uh, to start with, it would be good to know if you could kind of like tell us a bit where does this 
debate uh, comes from what's the history, why is such a kind of like um, uh, divisive issue, and where and you know a bit of history of this of this conversation that has been happening. Um, starters and we talk, we talk like an exclusive just I'm just talking about how uh, the tag method defines um, and so of course the best violence but a when first I have this obsessive focus on what, uh, Peter the connection is cutting a bit more okay um do you think it's an internet thing or oh, okay i think it's a bit better now let's try that again all right uh how's how's it sounding uh a bit better i think okay um <clears throat> oh yeah just let me know if um if it cuts out again how how far back should i go should i start from the beginning uh maybe yeah yeah okay yeah uh, for starters, when we talk about nonviolence, we're talking about an exclusive practice that tries to only allow uh, tactics or methods that um, that you know, they define as nonviolent. And so the counter to that, not uh, violence, uh, but a diversity of tactics and, and a diversity of methods and, and beliefs and strategies without an obsessive focus on often moralistic definitions of whether or not a specific action is is violent um i mean there are as many histories to this debate as people who can who can tell it in in my experience uh coming of age like around the, the anti-globalization movement and um and then the anti-war movement like late 90s early aughts it, it was very much uh a question of of a, a non-violent hegemony that that for the most part social movements in the global north were um, were dominated by nonviolent groups who often cooperated with the media and with the police to uh, to prevent anyone from uh, you know from breaking with um, with the action plans that they that they set out or the limitations on tactics. Uh, so in that context, it was very much uh, an effort of of you know some people to reconnect with. Um, with histories of struggle that were more radical, that that were more effective, uh, and that used a, a very wide range of tactics. So we had to sort of break this stranglehold on um, on discourse, on on strategy, and and reconnect with these histories that have largely been silenced. But to be fair, you know, there's going to be a lot of other um, uh, other other histories, other other points that that debate comes out of. So you know, some folks who um, who survived, you know, certain struggles in the 60s and 70s, you know, there, there were also moments of debate where maybe a specific movement had, uh, you know, had a, a very, um, was very, was very locked into a more militaristic strategy. Uh, to me, I mean, to criticize that effectively, that's a, that's a critique of, of militarism and not of, um, of, of violence per se, which is, of course, a very vague, uh, vague category. But, you know, there were, you know, there were certainly other moments when people were like, getting into this debate over what tactics and strategies are appropriate from a completely different angle. And has it always been the case that, uh, well, not always, but uh, in, mo in sort of like uh, the current period, has it always been the case that nation states and, and other um, institutions uh, part of the establishment have tried to use this uh, kind of kind of rhetoric of leveling people violent or not violent and stuff like that or is this kind of like a modern phenomenon uh, it's it's been going on for a very long time uh, i don't think the word violence the category was used systematically to sort of describe uh, or police the actions of people in social movements uh, until until the 20th century uh, really, especially with uh, I think the popularity of of uh, particularly Gandhian violence, uh, though it was certainly categories of violence were used to generate social alarm, you know, about supposed dangers to society. Certainly, going back to the 19th century and before, um, 
So, so yeah, at, at this point, it's definitely, it's definitely, uh, but also to realize that uh, governments will uh, frequently encourage um, uh, people on the right, on the right wing, to to attack other members of society who are, you know, portrayed as as dangerous or disloyal. Uh, but then they're very, very invested in in policing anyone who is talking about some kind of liberatory, emancipatory, revolutionary change to society. Anyone who's talking about, you know, a, a world in which everyone can be free, a world in which we actually address these very deep uh, oppressions that run all throughout our society. Anyone who's coming at, at you know, social change from that angle is of course uh, held to the strictest standards of nonviolence by the media, uh, by politicians and, and by um, all institutions of the state. Mm -hmm. Although um, something that we've seen a lot recently in some of our movements, in particular in the environmental movement in uh, in the UK and other countries, is that activists themselves uh, have taken this rhetoric of non-violence um, and kind of advocated it as the most effective uh, strategy. Um, what do you think are the main issues with uh, with this enforcement and promotion of of, of non-violence in political movements? Referring specifically to the newer the newer formations in uh, in ecological movements, just the level of historical amnesia is a huge problem, and the level of disrespect to other ongoing movements. So, I mean, the environmental movement isn't new. There are just some new players on the scene that uh, you know that have been getting a lot of media attention, um, and they not only have ignored a lot of uh, historical movements that, that were very important and that, uh, you know, give us a lot of experiences that we can learn from, uh, but they also are movements that, you know, that are ongoing today or that have been extremely recent, uh, like the, the various um, ZADs in France, uh, Zones mm -hmm. to Defend, especially the most famous one at, um, uh, pardon my French, but uh, Notre Dame, uh, which, which airport it stopped a, a, like a project which you know connected to one of the industries most involved in the destruction of the planet um you know they successfully stopped uh that airport project and in the meantime also people create a completely different relationship with the land you know one that's based in in knowing the land and respecting the land becoming a part of the land rather than you know these um uh, sort of alienated machines that just move over uh, and outside of nature, uh, that's that's extremely important. That's a major victory, and it was won using a diversity of tactics. Uh, all of the the struggles against pipelines in in North America, um, inspired uh, uh, largely and in many cases centered on indigenous resistance. Less uh, a diversity of tactics there, uh, and connected to you know a much longer history of struggle. Um, struggles in indigenous territory all across the world, shutting down mines, stopping hydroelectric dams or forestry plantations that use a diversity of tactics. And, and it's just absolutely arrogant to come onto the scene and, and not connect with those other struggles, not, not learn from them, not engage in dialogue in them. And of course, every new movement can offer something new and every new person or a group of people who starts participating in the struggle uh, have have something new to bring and they have something new to say that's that's valid but you know not if they're not able to listen not if they're not at all interested in in you know the people who are already out there holding it down and and who've been passing on uh, experiences of how to fight back for for generations uh, which is probably exactly why those movements are getting so much media attention because they are helping accomplish the break that uh, capitalists need and that politicians need so that the very people and institutions who are responsible for destroying the planet can be the ones that sell us back uh, the solution, which is basically green capitalism, uh, government financing for huge infrastructure projects that will let those who already own everything uh, profit a, a little bit more. All of that's impossible if you have you know, a view of um, defending the earth that sees people as as a part of nature that's connected to 
uh, uh, indigenous struggles and worldviews that's connected to an anti-capitalist or an anarchist analysis. Um, I mean, in general, I think as just like across the board with, with any struggle, I think it's a, like a good, um, a good basic rule is, you know, don't trust people or organizations that, uh, that don't show solidarity with the prisoners of the struggle. So there are people who are in prison right now uh, because, you know, they've, they've been, uh, you know, breaking capitalist laws to defend, you know, to defend a forest, to defend a, um, a swamp or a salt marsh or a specific species or to defend the way that they uh, grow food in relation with the land. Um, uh, or, you know, to, to, to strike back against animal testing or any of a number of things. There are people in prison right now for those reasons. And, you know, uh, I think the, um, the motivations of a supposedly environmentalist organization that doesn't even mention them, that just lets them rot in prison, are highly um, Why do you think uh, so certain activists and movements adopt these ideas? Do you think this... Uh, are there institutions who play a role in, in kind of like promoting them, like NGOs, uh, political parties, progressive media and stuff like that? And how do they accomplish that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a problem with um, with the left in general and, and any critique of the left. It's, it's very messy. Like these organizations, these movements, they bring together people who are absolutely sincere, uh, who, you know, with whom it's completely possible to be in solidarity. Uh, together with opportunists, with powerful institutions that are part of the problem, which we're seeking to profit off of the problem. Uh, so, you know, so it's it's um, tricky to make these criticisms in a way that that don't make, you know, potential allies uh, sort of, you know, stick closer to, to, to those who, who we need to fight against. Um, so, I think I need to answer that question sort of, you know, at, at like a different, at different levels at once. I mean, on the one hand, what's happening to, to life on this planet, what's happening to all of us and all of the living beings that, you know, that, um, that we live in relation with is extremely depressing. Uh, and when something is so depressing, when, when, you know, so much harm is being caused by such a, a huge inexorable machine, it's the easiest thing is to either just like ignore it uh, just kind of close your eyes, pull up, pull up the covers, and hope it'll go away, or you know, um, uh, rush to to sort of magic wand solutions. Um, and then you know, by um, by like a magic solution, I'm talking about something where you know we think we can just uh, you know uh, pull pull a lever uh, where we don't have to give anything back, we don't have to engage in any fundamental transformation. And and you know it will just spit out a solution. So like uh, you know um, governments that that have been ensuring that that ecocide continues apace will suddenly be the ones who are protecting the environment, or uh, you know the the corporations that are that are making billions off of uh, off of exploiting people, exploiting other living beings, exploiting the pl planet as a living system will suddenly start producing products that uh, protect the planet. Um, you know that, that's absurd. Any reasonable person can see that that's absurd. But there, you know, all of us have a huge uh, emotional interest in not seeing the absurdity of that because otherwise it means it's on us. Otherwise it means we all have to do the really hard work and face the very serious risks of um, of, of changing this, of putting a stop to this this ecocidal machine. So so people on the base, that's like that's you know on the one hand like a, a sincere kind of honest mistake of why they're they're supporting. Um, methods that that aren't going to help and that might even make things worse on the other hand you know governments governments stay in power by mobilizing social conflicts and by presenting themselves as the arbiters of of social conflicts and social crises so if anyone's going to solve this, you know the governments have to be at the table they have to to define the process so we get things that you know really have no hope of um you know even in terms of like this very limited technocratic focus on climate change they don't have a hope of of preventing the tipping points that we need to prevent like the paris accords the important thing is that people are spectators watching you know their governments our government supposedly uh talk about solving this thing uh capitalist capitalism is 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 facing a pretty huge crisis of accumulation they need uh you know constant um subventions constant financing uh constant uh investment opportunities 
uh, there needs to be you know a new industrial expansion and a switch to so-called green energy is you know that that would be uh, certainly a great boon uh, to capitalism so they're very interested in financing an environmental movement that is domesticated that plays ball and that um, you know aids in this more technocratic reductionist ap approach which is mostly only looking at atmospheric carbon rather than looking at the earth as uh, an interconnected web of relationships of which we are a part in which every single thing affects every other thing so you can't you can't look at you know atmospheric carbon without looking at sea otter populations without looking at hunting practices without looking at how we grow our food um etc 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 and then you also have uh ngos in there whose um directors make huge freaking salaries and who are involved in genocide like the world wildlife uh the wwf which is involved in genocidal practices in in africa because they're still locked into this colonial mentality where nature and humans are mutually exclusive so they're helping fund uh paramilitaries that are that are attacking indigenous people and kicking indigenous people off their land i mean the problem is not humans humans have been around for a really long time uh, planetary scale ecological disaster is is a relatively recent problem it's caused by capitalism it's caused by colonialism um, and then the sort of you know regional or continental uh scale problems that you saw before that they didn't happen everywhere they weren't plenty of human societies that still exist today that know uh, how to exist as a healthy part of their ecosystem. I mean, whether we want to be or not, we're a part of the ecosystem always. Uh, you know, we can continue to rationalize nature to turn it into, into a factory and, and, you know, control, control uh, you know, outputs, input on and so forth. For spots as nature reserves that, that, you know, we can charge uh, tourists money to access. Or we can actually realize that that you know we're we're a part of the earth and we're connected to all other living things and to, to get rid of capitalism to get rid of all the social machinery that alienates us and that prevents us from from acting that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also in terms of uh, how these ideas are spread and what role do they play in kind of like the machinations of the state there's this idea of uh content surgency uh that the states use in order to um uh undermine social movements and i wanted to know a bit uh, if you could talk about what it is and how it's related to non-violence and how do the governments use it to accomplish their objectives uh yeah uh so in in the science of the state you know of course they're they're studying for social control for maintaining and increasing their power in in the past in sort of the more modern period uh using this this sort of hobbesian metaphor of society as a body with the state as you know as its as its brain um peace was was thought to be the the sort of natural order of of society with with the note of course that you know the only society they're interested in is a society ruled by a state so they're kind of ignoring the possibility of any other kind of society so they they were sort of um you know inclined by their prejudices to believe that peace was the natural state of of the statist society and so um using the sort of like biologicism that, that was common to modernity they would look at disorder as like an infection a sickness that was caused by some agent coming from the outside so frequently in like the late 19th and early 20th century these these police agencies that were cooperating across europe and north america sharing information at that moment in particular about anarchist agitators um they frequently used the metaphor which one gets the impression they weren't even aware was a metaphor of of these anarchist immigrants uh as as you know a sort of pestilence like a, this um you know external um external sickness that needed to be expunged from the social body in order to make the social body healthy uh that 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 police philosophy and that science of social control proved again and again to be ineffective and so finally uh with with the british actually sort of taking the lead in this uh primarily with with their their experience against the independence movement uh the anti-colonial movement in Japan but immediately connecting this to experiences and and to sort of the science of social control um 
uh, in Ireland, in India, elsewhere, and then immediately connecting other colonial, neo-colonial and, and settler states, uh, you know, like France and the US. Um, they realize that in fact, it's much more helpful and more accurate to realize that the, the, the natural condition of society under the state is constant warfare, which interestingly enough is, is very similar to the idea of social war developed by the, the anti-authoritarian feminist Andre Leo, who was a, a veteran of the Paris Commune a century earlier. Um, and then, you know, since then really uh, elaborated by, by insurrectionary anarchists and others, this idea of social war. So, so basically that's the reality that the state is warfare against all of us constantly, that states actually have to realize that, that their existence hinges on warfare against their own populations. Because counterinsurgency methodology pretty much immediately was adapted by states to use against, you know, their, their own privileged citizen populations, uh, privileged citizen in, in the sense of, you know, like uh, if it was initially um, developed in Kenya, it was quickly brought to, you know, um, uh, Brixton, Bristol, uh, Los Angeles, and Detroit. Um, so, so it was never, you know, really like a, a marginal reality for, for the colonies. It's, it's uh, something that, that in a way unites um, how, how states view, you know, any of their, their, their subjects, colonial or otherwise. Um, so they had to realize that the conflict was permanent and that they couldn't, you know, ever, uh, even though they continue to use the trope of outside agitators because it's a good way to delegitimize people, they couldn't actually think like that. They had to realize that they're in constant conflict with their society and what they had to do was manage the conflict. Um, so that means, for example, intelligence agencies and, and you know, police agencies, sometimes they'll let a certain amount of stuff fly, like they might you know, be doing intelligence gathering and they'll be aware of, of illegal activities and decide not to arrest anyone because you know, if you arrest people, then you're, you're kind of shocking the movement, you're giving away information of what you know, and then the movement has the opportunity to, to um, improve their security practices. Whereas if you just keep spying on them and watching and, and you know, do social mapping, then you have a better chance of knowing everything that's going on. And, and you know, um, you can, um, you know, your opponent, your enemy, the social movements will, will you know, hopefully for the state, uh, continue to be lax about their security practices. So that's just like one um, practical uh, difference that, that counter strategy brings about. Basically, the goal, the broad goal of counterinsurgency strategy is to stays at the post level, which is nonviolence. Um, and, and, you know, the, like Frank Kitson, this, um, this British military figure, sort of theorized uh, three, different, three different levels of social conflict with like the lowest being, uh, you know, like uh, preparation being nonviolent and the highest being full-blown insurgency. So the goal is to keep resistance from ever getting to full-blown insurgency in which all those of us, those of us on bottom, also wake up and realize the state means um, we are, to our, um, we are cutting, it's cutting a bit, uh, Peter again. Uh, yes, it's still cutting. Hmm. Uh, try again. Yes, still so, okay. Um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, an old infrastructure is not the grand. Um, yeah, it's just still cutting. Um, all right. Maybe. Uh, pretty inaudible. Okay, okay. Uh, try again. Is it pretty inaudible? How, how? Okay, it's back is now. Is quality getting better now? Yeah, it's better now. It's back? Okay. All right. 
Uh, what was the last thing that you heard? How, how far back? Uh, someone said in the chat that you got to a stage three full-blown insurgency, uh, which is what they're trying oh, right. to yeah, avoid. Yeah, I see that. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, so, Steph. Yeah, so, so basically they, um, the state wants to avoid the conflict getting to full-blown insurgency, which is basically the point at which, you know, all of us, all, all the subjects of the state, realize that we are uh, we're at war and, and fight back. Uh, the state would prefer to, for this to be a uh, a one sided a one sided war, um, and so nonviolence is useful uh, to the state within counterinsurgency uh, methodology because it disciplines people to um, to formulate their struggle as demands in dialogue with the state, which of course ensures that the state you know will you know always. Have have a role in that, and and you know can prevent um, uh, uh, can prevent being negated in the process of uh, of the struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this is such a topic, uh, this is a topic that's a bit difficult to research because you can find a lot of information about it online. Uh, even you know you can buy some of the like the the field manual from the U.S. Army. Uh, you can find it the PDF online. Uh, I think it's the three twenty four something like that. Uh, or you can even buy it and you can get the the you know the the one they use in nature and all that kind of shit. But that's always written from their perspective and it's really useful to to read about it, to read them, to learn how they think. But also, it's it's difficult to kind of extrapolate like. What they're actually doing, trying to do. So, it, what are good resources or ways that people can kind of like better understand how the uh, how the state deploys these tactics, how they uh, what strategies they use, and all that. If you can think yeah. of any. Uh -huh, sure. There. Um, uh, I mean, there's a really good history of policing uh, in you know, in the United States, um, although some references are made to the UK by uh, Christian Williams, Our Enemies in Blue. And mm -hmm. there are a number of, um, I, think, I think a lot more anarchists are starting to um, sort of deploy this, this thinking in, like in our, um, our analysis of ongoing social conflicts and, and whatnot. Um, I mean, you know, like, even like the, the, the concept of recuperation, which figures mm -hmm. very heavily in, in Bonanno, in Aifericorti at Daggers Drawn. Uh, I mean, you know, that's that's like in different language, a very direct reference to um, to how the how the state works, you know, including with with methodologies of, of counterinsurgency. So that is without a doubt useful. Um, some there have been some essays that have been written uh, that have been very good analyzing the um, the anti-racist, anti-police rebellion. Uh, that that uh, began or began again uh, after George Floyd's murder in um, in the U.S. Uh, this past summer, and which of course spread to um, to many other places, the U.K. included. Um, uh, let's see. At the at the moment, I can't uh, remember uh, the title of um, of the is main it, article that I'm thinking about. But I'll, one, if I uh, is it one of the ones published by Ill Will Editions, maybe? Uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, they definitely uh, incorporate that thinking. That would be that would be people, uh, and I'll and I'll try to think of others, and you know maybe uh, type type them in as as we go. Uh, also, if anyone out there has read anything good, that's definitely like a, a recent case in which people were analyzing, um, mm. uh, you know, sort of counterinsurgency strategies for. Um, oh crap! I, yeah, I wrote something too, kind of looking at uh, how the um, uh, the outside agitator trope. Is used to uh, to delegitimize uh, the the resistance. So yeah, please, you know, anyone who's listening, feel free to share article recommendations. But that's you know that that lens has has been very prevalent in mm -hmm. analyzing, especially from the left. Because most interestingly enough, even though you know the right wing and the cops have have killed like several dozen people in, in the course of, of of that uprising, it seems that it's actually been the institutional left and the center left that have been more effective in in pacifying those rebellions. Mm -hmm. um, what? Well, that's a really interesting point. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, I mean, I think that's frequently the case. Um, the 
the right wing needs to make recourse to a, a, a far greater level of violence in order to just completely stamp out um, to, to, to stamp out movements and social struggles, which of course they've, they've done in, in the past, uh, famously, but that level of violence, uh, and that level of, you know, of, of just like, you know, murder and repression also tends to have like a, you know, um, destructive effects on, on capitalism, whereas the institutional is better positioned to divide and pacify the movement by encouraging certain, at least for a while, like we saw how quickly, you know, city council members and whatnot went from advocating, you know, funding enough that they defunding the police for like a month. Um, and, you know, just be to be. Um, it's cutting up again, I think. Um, yes, uh, I was cutting a bit again. Uh, yeah, hopefully it doesn't last as long this time. So yeah, mm -hmm. just let me know. Okay, uh, seems a bit better now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, right. So with with the institutional left, you know, being closer to the movement and sometimes mm -hmm. partial the movement, they have better intelligence. They can you know identify different. You sort of divide the movement into sectors, you know, identify radicals and isolate them uh, through discourses of nonviolence, through discourses of responsible reform. And, and you know, when the movement is divided like that and, you know, the radicals are isolated, then, uh, you know, uh, police repression also becomes more effective because the police are not really out and, you know, often the, the, the way that they direct their violence uh, radicalizes more people encourages people to to fight back stabilizes things even more um yeah i think that's something that is very important for um for, for people involved in social movements to be aware of because it's it's quite um i think it's quite disheartening for a lot of people and and sometimes hard to believe that you know uh movements organizations and people that you may see as your ally uh they can have can have this kind of like uh yeah play this role uh in the counter on your strategy of the state um so yeah i think re people really it's something that people should be aware of for sure um and so we've talked about a bit about what how um kind of uh, non-violent proponents um hide the history of uh, of social movements um in order to make their points but uh is uh, something else that you that you can i think talk about in your books is that diversity of tactics as is not only something that has been always present but also that tends to be actually effective and and actually you know deliver be generally better results uh than you know keeping to la to just non-violence whatever that means uh why do you think is the case what do you think uh you know allowing for different strategies to um to to assist uh, together uh why is that more effective uh for social movements yeah for a lot of different reasons um in in situations of of conflict in the streets it's it's just a lot more difficult for a a centralized unified enemy like the state like police forces to um to go up against a very complex heterogeneous uh, and sometimes even chaotic uh opponent which you know in in one place is using you know peaceful tactics like a you know, a candlelight uh, vigil or a peaceful march or, you know, shaming uh, officers in another place, it, you know, has a shield line and is trying to push past the police and in another place is engaging in like running street battles, uh, vandalizing, looting, attacking and disappearing. Um, that's that's historically, and, you know, all, and there's recent examples of that and old examples of that. It's always been much more difficult for states to go up against. Um, in, in terms of, of, you know, sort of the ecosystem of a social movement, the, you know, the more 
uh, breadth and diversity and difference there is, the healthier that social movement is, the healthier debate there is, you know, the more different practice you can try out at once. It, it can, um, it can work as, um, as, as a laboratory. Uh, it can tackle multiple issues of the problem at, at the same time. Uh, so, I mean, centralized decision making is, is actually very connected to, to, to unity, like the, the unity of tactics and the unity of strategies that, um, that the left is usually referring to. Uh, like that, that unity, it has to pass through some kind of uh, centralized point of decision making and, and legitimacy. And centralized decision making is, is never more effective. It's never faster. The only advantage that it has is it allows authoritarian control of a larger body. Um, by creating a sort of choke point where where legitimacy can be can be doled out, so um, so yeah, diversity of tactics and methods is is more effective for uh, for all of those reasons and more. And um, how do you think? Um, uh, ca how can we can uh, prevent these uh, you know these institutions? Uh, to spread these ideas of nonviolence, to impose those ideas of nonviolence, how can we keep uh, you know the idea of diversity of tactics alive and healthy in our movements, and how can we promote it? Have you you know what kind of strategies have you seen? What have you tried? Um, and yeah, what 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 kind of uh, ideas can you give us to you know to to do it ourselves? All right. Um... Really quick, just want to make sure the sound quality is good because you cut out for a brief moment. Uh, I think it's good now. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so one thing that um, I think is really important and I think is not thought about enough, in, um, at least in, in the English-speaking world, is, is the style of historical, uh, which you know, I'm just translating from. From a couple, it's also yeah, uh, common in, in Spanish, Italian, uh, which which is this idea of history, something that lives in books, but history that uh, exists in in groups, in 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 collective sharing and experience. So, in this view, history is something that we have to keep alive. It's not something to just archives, and in a movement, that means constantly reconnecting with with the past, with experiences of struggle, reconnecting with the people who survived those struggles who are still alive today, uh, sharing stories from, you know, from even older struggles, and keeping them alive, keeping them in the streets, you know, having, having events uh, about, these, um, about these, these histories of struggle and how they directly connect to the present in our social centers, in our events, and so on and so forth. I've noticed that nonviolence is is very like exclusive nonviolence is strongly connected to historical amnesia. It's strongly connected to movements that forget their past. Um, and I, I think like a good it's good to to check in every now and then. You know how many people in a movement have like a, a good strategic memory of things that happened five and ten years ago, whether it's like cases of repression or you know a big protest movement and riot or a particularly effective resistance. Um, and, you know, just having conversations with, uh, uh, with, you know, with folks who, you know, maybe, you know, you, you know them five or 10 years ago and checking in with them, like if they know about these arrests, if they know about those riots, if they know about uh, such and such campaign. Um, and if, if a significant number of people don't even have like a strategic memory of things that happened five and 10 years ago, and by strategic memory, I mean, you know, they don't have to be able to write like a freaking doctoral thesis on it, but at least they should be able to know enough about the meaning of that event that, that they can use it as, a, as like a strategic reference. Like, oh, well, when, when that happened, it really, really helped that people started, you know, having potlucks among all of the friends and family members of people who got arrested because it let us see each other, we could support each other emotionally and so on and so forth. Like, that's what I mean by like a strategic memory, like at least like enough detail so that we, we've learned something from it. Um, if a significant number of people in a movement don't have like a strategic memory of, of things just five and 10 years ago, then, um, then we're in trouble. Um, so, so that's one thing, like, uh, you know, this continuity of history. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how, how things are in, in the place where everyone lives right now, but if you're in a moment of social peace, if you're in a moment when the state is successfully 
hiding, covering up um, the, the main conflicts. And there isn't, I mean, you know, mostly the, these tactics and these, these strategies, they live on in movements. But if there's not a strong movement at the moment, then, you know, then we can do events uh, popularizing movements that inspire us. You know, you can you can people uh, the Zad and block the airport. You can do a you know a video call with uh, with people who who participated in the struggle at Standing Rock, uh, or or, or you know, uh, trying to to stop uh, oil pipelines and so forth. And so yeah, it's you know we have to actively keep them actively build relationships and build connections they they don't just uh pop up by themselves and i find that when we do that then then people are are most inclined to consider to be really aware of um of the tactics and methods that have been used to win the few victories that we've won to protect the few things that uh you know that we still have that we can call our own whether they're traditions or whether they're labor rights or whether they're um uh, you know, uh, wetlands or forests that, that haven't been destroyed. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely uh, very, very important. I think, I mean, personally learning about the, the, history, the history of a struggle from the, the places I was born uh, that was completely hidden from me uh, where I was growing up was, you know, extremely important in my kind of like radicalization. And I think that's the case with many, many other people. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's that's uh, yeah. I think that's the that's that's something very important to keep alive. Um, talking about uh, the victories we've had, um, something that you talk about in the failure, the failure of nonviolence is that uh, sometimes the criteria that nonviolent campaigners often use to determine uh, uh, what a victory is and to claim a victory doesn't really you know, represents, you know, a meaningful victory for what we want. And in instead, you talk about other a different criteria uh, that we can use to evaluate uh, or kind of like uh, the victories that we do have. So if you wanted to, if you could talk a bit about that, um, that'd be great. Uh, yeah. Um... I mean, like personally, like uh, the, the the main example for me is that as as I was growing up and as I was starting to become uh, active in in social movements, um, referring to the civil rights movement in in the U.S. like the the fifties and sixties, uh, the movement that um, that got rid of legal segregation by race in in the U.S. Um, basically, all the all the white people that I spoke with uh, considered the movement a victory. And and all the black comrades I spoke with uh, did not consider the movement a victory. They considered it uh, either you know uh, like a, a failure or something that was still going. And and you know that's um, obviously a very a very distinctive difference. Um, so I mean you know like if if a victory can can win a change that that makes you know survival a little bit easier for a group of people, or if a movement can win a um a symbolic change which which affects how how a group of people is viewed by the rest of society or how they view themselves you know that's important that's not something to to ignore but when when a problem is is so deep rooted that it runs through every aspect of society like capitalism like white supremacy uh like like the the exploitation and the destruction of the environment um it's it's just uh, you know completely insincere to to claim a major major victory when the only thing that's been won is is at best uh, a step towards a meaningful victory, and it's obviously very much in the interest of power, and this is certainly in line with counterinsurgency thinking, to spread the narrative that a movement won, if that movement had potential. So so any movement that questions uh um environmental destruction has the potential for being radical because you know like, like you pointed out in in the introduction that anyone who's who's willing to open eyes there they're going to start staring capitalism right in the face because capitalism is inherently ecocidal uh anyone who's concerned about racism and white supremacy 
you know, that's, that's potentially very radical because, you know, the, that's, you know, they have the, the potential to see how that's an organizing principle across society, how it's connected to colonization, which is, you know, which is how Western society became global in the, in the first place, um, connected to the birth of capitalism. So, so, you know, you know, it would require us to start criticizing all of these other aspects of our society. Uh, so it's very much in the interest of the state for people to think that a struggle against racism was successful because then people can think, oh, good, there's no more racism or there's only a few backwards people who are still racist today. Or in the, in the case of a, um, a decolonization movement, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very useful um, this, for the state to get people to think that the, um, the independence movement in India was a complete success because then, you know, we're not going to be looking at neocolonialism. We're not going to be looking at how that power can, can continue in some other form. And, and then a different example, also extremely useful, it's, it's very, very helpful for people to think that Martin was the decisive factor in ending the war against Vietnam which is of course historically a total manipulation that's that's not the case at all but you know nonviolent uh, advocates believed their own lives the state and the the capitalist media certainly helped them to promote such that in 2003 when the US and the UK and other countries were getting ready to invade Iraq again there were all these people who thought that a, a peaceful protest movement would actually be uh, able to prevent the invasion so after the largest protests in human history in March of 2003, um, which were in, in most countries uh, uh, exclusively, almost exclusively nonviolent, other campaigners predicted that it would then be impossible for those states to invade Iraq because, you know, they had this, this movement which was even larger than the peace movement in Vietnam. And of course, that was delusional. That did not end up being uh, how that played out. And so that's a very direct example of um, how the state, by helping to spread a, a sort of history, protected itself from real forceful and dangerous resistance against the Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of like, uh, I don't want to take much more time. I want to you know, give the opportunity to give the opportunity to people to ask questions and make contributions. So if people want to ask questions on the chat or even if they want to uh, unmute themselves, uh, just let me know in the chat. Uh, or if they want to, you know, uh, ask, you know, give contributions, maybe talk about uh, uh, useful memories of resistance that they, that they want to kind of like share with us, uh, experience with kind of like non-violence campaigners and, and how they, how that's uh, affected them and stuff like that just really anything um yeah feel, feel free to do so uh i'm going to use the opportunity in the meantime to promote a couple of events that we have coming up um the first one is on the first of december so next week uh we have another live streams like this one where we're going to be talking with the full poverty action um which is a campaign to um um uh to take uh control to take back control of the electric supply from companies and into the, into the hands of the people as a way to uh to um to 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 you know to 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 tackle the issue of uh of cold in the winter of uh of affordable energy energy and all this uh so we'll be talking with them next week and also on the 10th of December, we have a film night where we are going to be uh, discussing permaculture. Uh, you know, you've seen on social media that we are kind of like recently been uh, really involved with, well, we've been starting doing like community gardens and seed bombing and things like that. So we want to educate a bit ourselves as well. So we have a couple of films that we are going to watch and you can come and then we can discuss. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one of them by uh, is, uh, do you have any advice on convincing groups or individuals to, re to reject exclusive nonviolence? So this will be a typical case of, you know, do you have a friend or you are in some assembly or something, or people are kind of like really 
uh, stuck on the nonviolent uh, theme, how would you go about try, trying to kind of move that conversation into a more useful space? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. First, I want to start by saying uh, sorry for being long-winded. With the questions, I'll try to be more concise to make more for other people, and also to repeat, like you know, by all means, like you know, don't feel obliged to ask a question if you'd like to share your own experience or something. It doesn't have to be. Free. So, okay. Um, for the the first uh, question on um, let's see, convincing uh, yeah, convincing groups or individuals to reject exclusive nonviolence. Um, I would say that it's it's very important to encourage people to understand the types of things that are already happening, uh, particularly uh, uh, indigenous uh, resistance, uh, which is which is crucial to uh, you know to challenging colonialism, to challenging capitalism, and also to protecting biodiversity around the world. So it's it's just absolutely absurd to to try to conceptualize an environmental movement that includes and you know the present of, of indigenous resistance after that then the next step will be for people to say okay well kind of resistance is acceptable over there but here it's not a breeder or it's not for those people to oh, it's cutting a bit um, um uh, yeah it's cutting a bit again um, give it a few seconds maybe Um, yes, it's still, still happening, I think. Uh, maybe uh, while, while, while uh, the connection gets back, um, uh, yeah, if people want some examples of indigenous resistance that they can draw from, we did do a live stream a bit ago about the Mapuche, the Mapuche struggle. Uh, for autonomy, we got someone from uh, the uh, Mapuche Solidarity Network or Chile Solidarity Network uh, to talk about uh, their history, uh, their struggle, and their fight. Uh, and I think they are a really great example to kind of like that we can draw upon. So if you wanted to learn a bit more about that, that could be a place to start. Uh, uh, Peter, do you want to try it again? Yeah, uh, well, can you hear me now? Uh, I think it's better. Yeah. Um, uh, it was cutting a bit, but yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I can hear you. And just let me know if I should go ahead with the answer. Okay, I think it's better now. Okay, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, for your your patience with this uh, crappy internet connection. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I was saying like, yeah. So uh, the if, last thing, if you can, you know, go ahead. No, no, no continue. Sorry. Saying, if invincible recognition of of uh, you know indigenous and colonial connecting with those other struggles that are going on rather than just invisibilizing them duly their next step will be to say okay it over there but it's inappropriate or ineffective you know over here in insert you know wealthy majority white country wherever they happen to be living and so then you just need to introduce them to the crit critique of not in my backyard politics or nimby politics which you know has long you know pointed out to be like a racist politics not way of you know dividing globally so that you know oh how convenient you know people in these you know poorer countries have to face all the risks whereas you know we have to pour fake blood on ourselves on the steps of parliament so it's just this is not an acceptable um uh, division of risk so that's um that that can be useful to convince people. if if people have based their idea on this uh these statistical studies that have gone around that really prove that um that uh, nonviolence is more effective. You just need to point out that those studies, uh, aside from being formulated uh, for, you know, by and, and promoted by people who, um, 
worked, you know, for the U.S. government, for the State Department and the Defense Department, uh, and aside from, you know, those, um, you know, uh, get, getting rewarded very richly by, you know, by current uh, power structures, um, it doesn't it doesn't uphold the most basic standards for a statistical comparison because they don't even use the same standards for deciding which examples get in group included in group B. So it's basically a trash study which went international because it's saying what corporate media want people to hear. And I, I break that study down in more detail in the failure of nonviolence um, and also in a um, an article that I got published recently. Um, crap, I don't remember where, so I will uh, in the next couple hours uh, retweet that, that article from my from my Twitter. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we have another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on non-human resistance and on anti-specism being a fundamental aspect to consider in order to achieve a total liberation? Uh, uh, have your views changed? Uh, have your views on it changed after your uh, veganism why not essay was published? Yeah, um, I think non-human resistance is is really important. Uh, honestly, I think anti-speciesism tends to be a a sort of um, a liberal philosophical framework. It seems to be just a sort of extension of you know like the 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 basic concept of like the of framework and I also completely disagree with with this um, arbitrary tax on uh, distinction between animals and other other forms of life I don't think that's either like respectful or or realistic or very helpful I think we absolutely need to understand ourselves and constitute ourselves as as respectful parts of our ecosystems, you know, not any better or more important than any other form of life, not something that exists on top of the ecosystem, like we shouldn't understand um, other forms of life that exist for our, our exploitation. Um, and I certainly don't think that any living thing should, um, should live in a cage. Uh, but I also think that, um, that we need to be very guarded about uh, consumer politics or or politics that that you know have that potential for just uh, diverting into into ethical consumerism, which which is a trap, which is encouraged. I mean, the United Nations is encouraging you know, that dietary politics. Plenty of progressive cities like Barcelona, the city government is in, encouraging that kind of um, you know ethical consumer politics. And on the contrary, it it certainly you know. This is that that are most effective in terms of you know humans relating with their environment. Uh, for example, you know the, just the terms of tools um, for traditional hunting and fishing rights within uh, within indigenous movements across the Americas, uh, and, and I think like a, a, a culture that's based on supermarkets really has no grounds for for criticizing that. Um, uh, you know that that uh, uh, deeper and and you know much more intelligent of relating with other other living beings and, and like the more I've, done, I've also seen that a lot of uh, there are like here in in Catalonia there's actually very movement connected to a very very long history of commoning of, of like preserving the commons and and also you know preserving like a a more sustainable and respectful role for humans within their environment. Uh, that are actually coming from um, from pastoralists, from from shepherds who, like in the region of the pyramid uh, of the Pyrenees, um, uh, every region has Valencia, which is where like you move with the whole flock from like the highlands to the lowlands, or or vice versa. As, you know that actually pits them against you know the individualized property that was brought by. So that's um, you know a um, or shouting match I'll leave it for now. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, someone else on the chat make a really good made a really good point that another way to undo the narrative of nonviolence is to challenge what we define as violence. Uh, you know, violence is it can be seen as poverty, as oppression, you know, just physical violence um, or property damage. And I think that's a really, really good point. And you know, you Peter, you have done it in other places as well. 
and it tends to I think it's one of the biggest hypocrisies so that I've seen a lot of nonviolent movements in you know what they consider nonviolence, what they don't consider viol what they consider violence, what they don't consider violence. Um, Um, so, uh, we have another question as well. Uh, how do those using diversity of, acti of tactics uh, find ways to collaborate with uh, ethical pacif pacifists? So, for example, uh, people who are nonviolent for religious reasons uh, rather than pragmatic reasons. I'm uh, first time I went to prison. I my cellmate, my first cellmate of the first two. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's cutting a bit again. Dedicated his life. Damn. Yeah. Uh, any better? Uh, I think so, maybe. Oh. So, yeah. First time I went to like, for the first um, this Franciscan monk named who dedicated life to getting arrested again and again on, on military bases. Um, he's done so when I said something you're old or something, and you just um, human being really dedicated and just constantly to attend to U.S. prison. Uh, the um, death squad and the U.S. Uh, trained and trained in America and so on and so forth. Um, and I, because I live in, in my in oh, so, uh, sorry, Peter, it's still, uh, it's, it's, uh, we haven't been able to hear your answers cutting again. Okay, should, should I, let's say I'm reading. Uh, that Anna hasn't been able to answer, so should I start over from the beginning? Um, yeah, maybe start from the beginning. I think it seems now better. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna it's maybe a, yeah, I'm in some light shadow or something. How uh, how's it now? Um, maybe better. Yeah, most of the time, interaction works in this setup. Yeah, uh, mm. it seems to be cutting still. Oh, dang! No, heard my awesome joke then. Yeah. Um, is is anyone in the chat? Uh, do you, if is there anyone in the chat who wants to uh, do any contribution? Like we were saying, kind of like share a bit of um, you know the the experiences with this kind of like uh, struggles, uh, how they've tackled tackled them, any of that. You know how you know if if you're trying to like uh, educate anyone uh, about these topics or anything like that. If you're kind of like uh, uh, you know, uh, had any issues? Uh, you, yeah, that, this will be a great time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I understand people are a bit always, uh, I, I know people are always a bit shy to like unmute themselves and speak, uh, but like. Honestly, you have any, it, it, don't don't really worry about it. Um, or even if you want to like write something on the chat, I can also read it out loud if you're a bit shy about uh, speaking. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> someone is saying that they just received a very angry message in a group uh, uh, for sharing this event on Twitter. Uh, which is yeah very relatable <laughs> for sure. Um, uh, Peter, do you want to uh, try it again? Uh, sure. Yeah. How's it now? Uh, talk for a bit. Yeah. 
let's see how it goes. Um, just uh, yeah, checking how it is. Um, um, I uh, think yeah. I, how's how's the quality? It's a, it's a bit better, I think. Okay. Um, great. Okay, so should I start beginning? Um, it seems to be still cutting. I, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's still cutting. Uh, I mean, no, no worries. Uh, I think we, we know, we managed to like, uh, yeah, we managed. To, uh, okay, let's try it one more time. Um, How about that? Uh, Better maybe. All right. Um. So yeah. So I so I appreciate the question. Uh, what I was saying before is the the first time I went to jail, cellmate for two weeks was this Franciscan monk, uh, Jerry Zawada, who made his life going on to military bases and getting. And again, to attention to U.S. militarism, to death squad, nuclear weapons, and he was yeah like a total pacifist and was really beautiful human being. Uh, I think it's really important to to make connections with with folks like that and to talk sincerely about diversity of tactics in which there really is room for all kinds of people, kinds of sensibilities, uh, in which we. You know, we place great value on um, uh, peaceful tactics that are around communication or around mediation, um, conflict resolution, uh, art, healing, uh, all these different things. I mean, you know, there's there's I'm in a place for everything, or you know, almost everything. Not not snitching, yeah, you know, crap like <laughs> that, of course. Um, sometimes part of the problem is that. The, the you know the, the context that we're in in uh, the you know the hegemony of nonviolence is often enforced as an struggle and you know even you know for example sharing uh, sharing a tweet about just a discussion you know I'm so far as far you know I don't think anyone you know there is like you know hitting anyone else or anything like that so I, I think this discussion so far has been pretty peaceful but just the fact that we're questioning nonviolence you know we're getting angry about it um, it's we're going to respond, uh, you know, sort of um, arguing in favor of the value of combative tactics and destructive tactics and illegal tactics. We really have to fight sometimes to to get people to recognize the value of these these tactics that have been so deliberate and so demonized. Uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you know a diversity of tactics is not effective if it's a ladder of tactics. From you know the less important tactics, or tactics because that's just inviting a certain social hierarchy to creep into our movements and and it's hard for effective strategic analysis of what we do. So we really de do need to value uh, different forms of of being in the movement and being in the struggle. It includes you know peaceful activities that are absolutely vital to to, to any any healthy movement. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a really, really important point to recognize that within diversity of tactics, there's a space for everyone and for every tactic, and that uh, you know all you know all 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 different tactics, uh, as long as they are aim are, are you know are accomplished or objectives are, are are equal are as important as are valid, and because I don't want to uh, tempt the internet connection anymore, maybe this is a good place to. To leave it for now, I think that's a really, really good uh, message to finish off. Um, so yeah, I think uh, just wanted to like uh, thank you one more time uh, for being here for uh, um, for talking to us. It's been really good to talk with you. Uh, to everyone who came out, thanks so much to the Green Anti Capitalists for for organizing us.
uh, and thanks for all the patience for my crappy internet connection. I'm sorry that it chose today to act up. Uh, in like the next hour or so, if anyone's on on uh, Twitter, which I mean, hopefully you're not, but you know, <laughs> if unfortunately you are, like in the next hour or so, I will uh, I'll post some uh, reading recommendations as well as different titles and uh, and some follow ups and stuff. So yeah, thanks thanks again. And yeah, I'll we'll probably also try to compile that and put it on the website. So even if you are, you know, uh, free from the from the hell that is Twitter, we'll to be able to access it. Um, maybe in the future, um, mm -hmm. we may organize a discussion on content urgency with some of the titles and other stuff. I can't promise anything because you know we always strap for time, but we will try. Um, yeah, thanks everyone who, who was in the chat and contributed and asked questions and shared their experience. And definitely, uh, even after this, it will be amazing if you could uh, share your experiences and your and your ideas and your opinions about, around these topics, around uh, on the internet and with people in, in the social movements. Uh, I think this is really important that we have these discussions, especially now when I think a lot of um, Kind of uh, environmental movements are kind of like that have limited themselves to non to kind of like this type of non-violence are starting to show their limitations and their failings. So it's really important that we kind of like uh, present a, a, a better alternative, both in words but also in actions by showing these things in practice. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, I think uh, yeah, I'm just going to say uh goodbye for now yeah thanks everyone uh hope to see you soon see you in the streets have fun goodbye